Okay, I'm glad to have you here. <clears throat> Look on social media. Uh, I really see a lot of people who want to get into this now. It's, uh, it's probably the easiest time of anybody's life uh, to start carving, whether they want to call it carving or making a decorative, uh, uh, a decorative piece, a sculpture, uh, a working decoy, whatever. Um, there's a lot of how-to books out there, uh, videos. The Word Foundation puts on a lot of uh, instructional classes every year. Um, what I want to show you today, I don't, I don't really teach classes, but I try to learn people. Uh, the old heads I used to go to that say, boy, did you learn anything? And that's what I want to do today, try to learn you a little bit. I do work in decoys. I don't do decorative pieces of art. I just don't have the patience for it. Uh, I've been doing work in decoys all my life. The questions I really see on Facebook, mostly in the social media, from the, from the new people is what kind of wood you use, what kind of bandsaw, whether you need a knife, a hatchet, <coughs> excuse me, a uh, Fordham tool, a uh, Dremel tool. It really all depends on, on the person. If you've never made a piece at all, go out, buy a couple pattern books, get some ideas on how to, how to make your own pattern, uh, a pencil and paper. Pretty much if you can't draw a duck, you can't carve a duck. You need to have it in your mind what a bird looks like. Uh, don't start off, and again, this is for the beginners. I'm not talking about the, the decorative people, the professionals. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get the people to, to take baby steps in this. The type of wood you use, uh, you can use white pine, basswood, tupelo, cedar, cottonwood, uh, balsa. There's a multitude of woods. Do a little research, go online, that people are more than happy to point you in the right direction on where to go. I specialize in what's called polonia uh, cottonwood. Uh, this is a piece of it here. This is going to be a red breast of merganser. This is how far I take them down with a bandsaw. When I get the polonia, I get in a log form, usually eight foot logs. Uh, cut it to length, split it, dry it. It's got water in it, not sap. <clears throat> Go to the bandsaw, rough it out, chop it with a hatchet. I don't teach anyone how to use a hatchet. This is this is my working tool. You can pretty much get a find a little axe, um, send it off to get it sharpened by a professional. And if you want to try this, it's entirely up to you. I really don't recommend it. I would do more like using a jig here with a with a draw knife. But I'm going to show you. I'm going to demonstrate this. Then we're going to. Split a bird real quick. I'm going to hollow it out and show you how to attach the bottom board. It seems like people have a uh, hard time figuring out how to how to hollow, how deep to go, um, as far as what kind of nails or glue. So we're going to cover that pretty much, uh, and that'll be pretty much it. So we're going to get my get my bird lined up. You want them symmetrical? Again, I use a hatchet. That's about where the head's going to be. The shoulders. Uh, get a book. Know the anatomy of a bird. I asked a, a buddy of mine years ago when I was in competition what he looked for when he was judging. And he said he wanted the bird to be anatom anatomically correct. Well, that's a, that's a pretty big word to use, but you want, him to, you want the wingtips where the wingtips are supposed to be. The primaries, the shoulders, the side pockets. Um, don't expect your first bird to be perfect, but just keep plugging away at it. Again, I don't teach this, but this is how I've been removing the wood. You've got a general idea on chopping.
Okay, so here we are walking in the door. This is just an overview of the space. Uh, roughly 24 feet by 18 feet. Um, lighting was very important to me. So I have uh, about 10, 12, 14, 18, 16 feet of windows on the one back wall. Then I have three skylights on this far side. This is the east side. So bright morning sun comes in there. And we'll swing around here. This is the door we came in. There's a few simple uh, decoys I've collected from some friends. Door to the house that goes into the house. And here's basically my space. We have uh, coffee, have to have coffee in the morning. Uh, a few of my bigger ribbons from Ocean City shows. Here's a project commission that I'm in the middle of. It's Red Tail Hawk. This will be the west side window. Get afternoon light through there. TV to keep myself company. And back window looking into the yard. There's a feeder. You can see my hawk mews or houses facilities back there. There are three chambers for three different birds. And normally it's not this clean. Uh, currently I have two dust collectors, um, tornadoes set up. And in this far corner, there is a large dust collector, which is uh, sucked outside. Um, so there is a dust collection system in here other than tornadoes. See it here in the corner. Uh, these work tables are 30 inches off the floor, standard table height. Okay. There is room for easily eight people, very comfortable in here on these workspaces. Again, skylights on this wall. This is the east side. This is a little uh, bench top uh, storage area. I picked this up at a flea market. It's actually, it's an antique. These drawers came from an 1800 machine shop. Uh, this is a perch for birds. I bring the birds in here occasionally. And this center section here is basically my workstation. Uh, I do all of my work from here. I do not have a separate painting facility. Uh, when, when I'm painting, I uh, basically strip everything down, vacuum, and clean real well before I start paint. So this is my, my personal station. I have a dust collection system here. And it is sucked down into a box down here using a uh, blower from a um, house uh, heater. So I do all my carving here. Everything is here on my right hand side. These benches are much higher than the 30 inch bench. Uh, it's just more comfortable for me to be up higher. And actually it's it's uh, works well for teaching too. Uh, this is a project I'm going to get started actually tomorrow. It is a virtual class. It's going to be a barn swallow. And actually, aside from being virtual, there will be two students here in, in each of those two stations. I always have a computer here. I, I do a lot of stuff with the computer you know I just collect a file of photographs of the birds I'm carving and I refer to these a lot for feather shapes feather dynamics don't rely on so much for color because the photographs I, I don't know the resolution it, it's exactly right so I don't really rely on them for 
color, but I do I do use a computer a lot. Um, and you can see there's plenty of storage down here. This is my uh, compressor for my airbrush. I got my Fordham underneath here, high speed grinder there. Um, more storage on this side. And then over here, I have a freezer, believe it or not. <laughs> I have a freezer in my workshop. And I will tell you why in just a second. Over here on this side, I've got a little refrigerator, lots of soda, water, beer. Uh, actually, wine is in there too. This is the other side of the dust collection system that I work with. Up top of the bench, it gets sucked down into there and filtered out the air. So the reason I have the freezer over here is because it's for my uh, my hunting birds, my falconry birds. All the stuff we catch is portioned and frozen. And my wife is not real fond of me bringing bunnies and squirrels and stuff in the house using her freezer. So everything goes out here. Everything is cleaned out here and, and, and is stored in here. And I only have one bird currently, but this is what she has caught this hunting season. You can see it's full. That's all portioned squirrels and rabbits. And yes, I eat both squirrels and rabbits. So she, the bird shares it with me. In this white box is my partner, Sam. And she is going to be the subject of a three-day seminar that I'm going to do in 2022 in Ocean City. There she is. Come on, Sam. And she'll just sit here with me. She'll watch me. I don't do a whole lot of carving with her in here because the dust uh, can be harmful to her respiratory system. Uh, but when I'm painting or when it's chilly willy outside or I'm lonely, I bring her in here and uh, she'll just sit here and hang out with me. She just got home from hunting. She got a squirrel today. And again, 2022, we're going to uh, do a three-day seminar. We're going to carve, texture, and paint just a head, a red tail head. And here she's going to relieve herself. One of the hazards. Okay, so this is my shop. Again, it's big, it's roomy. I have enough room in here for easily eight. I've had as many as 15 students in here. And you can see the light. Light is very important, especially when we're painting. It makes carving much easier. And there we go. That's it. Thank you very much for visiting. Good morning, this is Tom Christie with you again. Uh, part two of painting a Gatwall Drake decoy. In part one, we focused on getting the base coat colors on the decoy and getting it into this condition. And in part two, we're gonna really move into the details of vermiculation, detailing the wings, the head, and the breast, and then finishing the decoy. So looking forward to it. Let's get going. I'm going to start in this rump area. Uh, a few things about setup. You want to have a nice sharp brush. This is a number four um, low Cornell 
ultra brown 7020 brush. I also use a number two periodically. And uh, I've got this set up for the camera. I would normally be doing this in my lap with a towel on my lap to protect the rest of the bird because you want to be in a very comfortable position um, as you do vermiculation. There's a lot of repetition and consistency is critical. So you want a nice setup. But for purposes of the video, we'll give this a shot in this position. I'm going to start with a series of small dots next to each other. And I'm using a chroma chestnut for this rump area back here. As you can see, I've got three lines following each other relatively close. This area is a series of overlapping feathers, so you're not going to see very clear patterns. There's going to be overlapping of the patterns, so I'm going to start another down here. Consistency of the paint is critical. Um, if it's too wet, it'll blob and give you inconsistency. If it's too dry, you won't get the right color and consistency you're looking for. Okay, this shows that uh, completed area of vermiculation. And I'm going to take a little carbon black and pull in some feathers from the black. to give the indication of some feather structure there. In the side pocket areas, we're starting with a darker color and we're gonna add vermiculation with driftwood uh, along with a touch of, of white to lighten. You can see I've started with one feather here. And now, as opposed to here, we're going to try to develop some zigs and zags in the structure as we go. So we'll start on this next feather. Again, just a series of lines next to each other. This is very meticulous work. You just have to have a lot of patience. So I'm going to start on the next line. I've got a little zag there that I'm creating and I'm going to follow that pattern every time I come back by that area. Here's a little zag area. I'm going to make a point there. Go on around the corner. I'm going to come back. Got a zag here. The other thing I like to do is so there I've created a little more definition in the zag. Highly technical terms, zig and zag. But you get the idea. I'm going to go again. The other thing I like to do is, is I'm going, um, taking the next row of vermiculation, look at the previous row and clean up as you go any gaps or sloppiness because it's inevitable you're going to end up with some areas that you'd like to go back and clean up a, a bit. So we've continued that vermiculation pattern up the side pocket feathers. I'm going to stop here because there's some transitional feathering between the breast pattern and the side pocket and so I want to plan that out. Now I'm uh, using the chalk pencil to lay out the breast feathers. So I have guidelines on as I uh, paint that area. I wanted to take a quick look at the, the anatomy of uh, Gabwell Drake's breast feathers. This is from a taxidermy sample. And you can see each feather is a series of concentric arcs. And then as they overlap each other, you'll see portions of those arcs exposed portions hidden. So we'll try to represent that with the painting that we do next. So just continue to work the patterns. Same technique, just 
paying more attention to the pattern. As you get closer to the breast, these, the distance opens up between vermiculation lines to where at the breast itself, there's just going to be the line on the edge of the feather and probably one more line showing um, on the breast feather. Here's a picture of the finished first pass for the transitional feathers and into the breast and around the front and then tied into the other side. You can see as these feather shapes change from the close vermiculation to a little looser and then eventually into the scallop breast feathering. So now we'll start to work on the vermiculation of the back and the cape area. We're still using the driftwood and uh, gesso mix and I'm starting to vermiculate these feathers. It's a little bit challenging standing up and doing this, but again, that's for the purposes of the video. And you want to create some zigzag patterns in this vermiculation. Notice on these uh, feathers, just on the top of the side pocket, I'm just vermiculating the lower part of the feather. And then I'll come back and show you the completed. I'm gonna continue that around here, take it up across the cape and some of these feathers on the back of the gadwall do not have a lot of vermiculation on them so we'll leave some of those uh, without vermiculation and then uh, we'll see the results here in a minute. I've completed the first pass of vermiculation now on the side pockets, uh, detailed the breast and now the cape and scapulars. So I'll give you a look at that. Now we'll begin working on some of the wing details. Taking the chalk pencil and laid out the feather structure of the wing and uh, done the same thing on the opposite side. So now we can go in with paint. All right, back to the 1 8 inch chisel scrubber again and I've got some burn umber and white paint on the scrubber and I'm just gonna go in highlight the separation between these black feathers. This is very subtle um, because the feathers are black and we're just trying to indicate that there is a layer of feather upon feather there. Now I'm going to use a little bit of carbon black and put some dark feather edges on these burnt sienna colored feathers. Come back with the scrubber now and put some darker tips on the edges of the wing feathers. This takes some time so I'll Work on this a little bit to get a nice blend and then show you the result. All right, I went ahead and finished up the wing details in the interest of time so that we can move on to the head. But I used a little chroma smoked pearl to put the small vermiculation in those wing feathers. Added some splits throughout, including up into the scapulars just to begin that process. Starting the detailed markings of the face, and I'm using chroma chestnut 
and a number four detail brush that is not particularly sharp because in this process we want to not leave a fine line but a kind of a teardrop shaped and I'm uh, putting groups of three, four, five together in kind of a V configuration as I move to, toward the back of the head. And these markings will change shape as we get closer to the back of the head and over the crown, and I'll cover that next. As we get closer to the back of the head, you go from a single mark into small groupings of marks, and these are going to begin to form, I'll call them small arches, because the feather pattern on this crest becomes a series of small inner overlapping arches. You can see I'm putting two, three, four, two, three, four groupings of bow shaped arches. Same, starting from the top of the eye, I've started arching some here. So this whole structure back in the crest area of the head is going to be that type of shape. And I'll come back and show you the finished and product. And as you get closer to the back of uh, the head and the crest, you have these series of arch-like markings. So I'm gonna do the other side of the head and then we're gonna come back and darken the markings of the crown. That'll be next. I used some carbon black and burnt umber chroma color to darken the markings on the top of the crest. As you can see the, and then I pulled a few lines through the crest to give um, some additional texture appearance to the crest. Next, we're going to work on darkening the eye stripe area and then some additional detail on the face. Now I'm using the small scrubber again with a little burn umber on it and just scrubbing to darken the line from the back of the eye across the edge of the cheek, kind of characteristic of uh, the Drake Gadwall. As a final detail, I'm taking a, a lightened version of the face base color and just putting some light colored ticks between the darker colored ticks to give uh, some depth to the face. Coming down the final stretch, and I'm going to use uh, a little darker shade of gray than is on the base tail feathers and begin to pull in some splits and start pulling some splits in the scapulars. You're trying to match the underlying feather value and then maybe a little darker so that it shows up. This is done in one quick motion and you pull the brush away from the surface as you go back in the feather so that it narrows as it ends the stroke. I finished detailing the tertials by pulling in some light and dark value splits and then uh, some black splits where it meets the, the rump. For the side pockets, I'm doing splits with smoked pearl to begin with, with just a little bit of the driftwood. And I'm pulling them through the light area of the base of the feather. You can see I've added a few darker splits with the uh, burn umber 
mixed in with the side pocket value and now I'm going in and adding some black splits where the uh, wing feather is going underneath that side pocket. Okay, the underside of the tail feathers are uh, completed very similarly to the top side. I just highlighted the edges of the feathers with smoke pearl, blended those in, and then added some feather splits, and then used carbon black to define the feather tips. To finish up, I'm highlighting some of the black rump area with a uh, burn umber with a touch of white just to give a little bit of a brown shade there. Also under the rump and on the other side here. And then I'm going to come back and add some dark black feathering so that we indicate some feathers in that area. Taken this filbert with some carbon black and scrubbed on some darker feathers. And then I'll come back with some splits and finish that area up. Here's a view of the rump area with the feather splits added so you can see there's a little structure in that black. Using an off-white and a filbert scrubber, I'm just lightening the lower part of the side pocket on both sides and then I'm going to pull that vermiculation in with some light detail. Just to finish up I've taken some off-white and pulled some of this vermiculation from the light belly feathers into the side pocket just to make a nice soft transition. I'd like to do a quick final color check with a with a real feather and it looks pretty good. Just do a quick final 360 on the completed gad wall for your reference. Get my hand out of the way. Hey everybody, thanks for participating in the painting demonstration of the Gad Wall. I hope you found it useful and you can apply some of these techniques to your carving. Good carving to all of you. Hey everybody, Kristen Sullivan here at the Ward Museum. And I'm wondering, when's the last time that you've been to the Ward Museum? Let's take a tour. Right now I'm in front of one of our changing galleries, the Welcome Gallery. When the museum first opened, this was a space where there was a video about, you know, about the museum and to welcome folks to the area. Now we showcase different exhibits all year long here and this gallery recently got a renovation. I'm so excited, so come check it out. You'll be some of the first folks to see it. This is the other changing gallery here at the Ward Museum. It's called the LeMay Gallery. And it's a huge space, thankfully, right now, because we have some monumental quilts in here. These are all by Dr. Joan M. E. Gaither, who's a Maryland Heritage Award winner, as well as an artist and educator. And, uh, and they're either quilts that are about her life or that are about the lives of communities in the region and, and across the country. And that she sometimes has made in cooperation with these communities. So check some of these out.
This is an especially exciting quilt for me to be in the exhibit because this is one that was actually made for this exhibit by dozens of different people. So right before the pandemic, we had a workshop with Dr. Gaither and we invited different community members and really the general public to come and learn about community quilting and story quilting. And several folks volunteered to take different squares that you see here in this quilt back to their communities and to tell their story. So we've got really many different stories woven together or stitched together as it were on this Lower Eastern Shore community quilt, which is now part of the Ward Museum's permanent collection. Okay, so what about decoys, right? Well, this is our decoy in time gallery, and it really tells the story of the history of decoys, why they came to be, what sorts of um, guns and boats early hunters would use, and, and how decoys really started to evolve, especially here on the Eastern Shore. We'll take a walk through. We're here now in the Henry A. Flickenstein Jr. Decoy Study Gallery. And this room is filled with fantastic antique decoys that really tell the story of how this art form evolved in different regions in, in the country, but also throughout North America. So we've got species and makers and materials represented from all the different flyways in North America, or sort of avian superhighways, those routes that, that birds use to migrate every year. And, uh, and you can see not only sort of the development in the art form, you know, artistic styles and maybe who influenced whom in this room, you can also see, you know, connections to the natural landscape and what materials were available to different makers, things like that. So it's a really fascinating room for the decoy historian. No visit to the Ward Museum would be complete without a trip to the Ward Brothers workshop. In this room, we have some of the Ward Brothers' earliest decoys, really up to the you know height of their decorative style, and it shows the evolution of their art form and, and the evolution really of the way these these barbers turned decoy makers, I think, thought about, conceptualized, and, and created wildfowl art. This is the gallery that I expect most of you watching this video during World's Weekend are going to be familiar with. You may recognize some pieces, maybe even one or two of your own. So this gallery really showcases some of the best of the best of our Ward World Championship winners. So check it out. I hope you enjoy these beautiful decorative sculptures.
I am now is the Andrews Emerging Artist Gallery. Ordinarily, this case here would be filled with winners from the Ward World Championship in the youth divisions. Right now, it is awaiting the winners of this weekend, so we'll see who goes in there after this weekend's competition. We also have on the walls here, though, uh, entries to our student art show. This year, they interpreted their experiences um, with uh, interacting with the natural environment during the pandemic, so that's why you see a lot of sort of window panes and that sort of thing behind us. But I love this gallery because it really shows you the future of this art form of, of decoy making, of wildfowl art, and of other artistic traditions. So it's one of my favorites because you really see the future here. Well, thank you so much for taking some time to be with me today. And I hope that we see you next year in Ocean City. I really look forward to celebrating then. And also stop by the Ward Museum. Say hello and check it out. Thanks so much for being part of our Virtual Worlds Weekend. Bye-bye. Why is the carving こんにちは。日本では桜が満開になってみころ迎えています。私はベンス好きです。ワイルドパールカービングを愛好して、ジェパンワイルドパールカービングコンペティションの代表を務めています。3年前に日本でも本格的なコンペティションを目指して、ジ
I'm not going to sit here and make the whole duck. We've got a lot to cover. These are some of the birds I've been doing for the past week. Uh, I've made about 55 pieces since January 10th. Uh, all species. I'm doing some, doing some ring necks. These are hollowed out. They've been split right here. I'm going to show you how to do that. Ring necks, hooded mergansers, buffle heads. Okay, so now what we're going to do, I've made this little guy, a little buffle head. I've carved it down, sanded it, and now it's ready to be hollowed out. I do everything freehand. I've got a little block of wood here I use for my, for my guide. And all I do is lay it against here. It stays nice and flat on the table. Watch your fingers, and I'm going to guide this thing through. I'm going to split the bottom of it off. Then I'm going to be on the drill press, hollowing it out. Um, I've got my drill press set. If you want to look here, I use a Fordham tool about an inch and a quarter. I mean, uh, yeah, a Forstner bit, about an inch and a quarter. I've got it set so it can't go through the wood. It's about half inch, three quarters of an inch. So when I come down, I know I can't go through the back at the deepest part. After doing several thousand birds, I pretty much know to how to judge the breast under the tail. So I'll show you that in just a second. I'm not going to put my mask on right now. I normally use a mask and the dust collector, but I'm just making the one cut. I also have a container of water here. And the only reason I use that is because my hands dry out so bad. You don't want this to slip when that saw is moving. little mark on each one just to line it up because when I put the glue on it I don't want to put the bottom board on upside down and have to smear my glue. I go about a half inch, three quarters of an inch and again I'm not trying to get it down to a certain weight. I want to hollow it out as twofold. You want to make sure you're getting all the moisture out of the wood in case it still is a little bit wet. Uh, so you hollow it out for that reason. Also to make it really light, because as lighter it is, the more weight you can add to the bottom as a counterbalance, so that when you throw this in the water and it hits upside down, it's going to flip up and sit nice and high. That's why I hollow everything out. Hollowing it out. I've got my nails, I've got my center punch. I use nothing but tight bond three. Not tight bond one, two, but tight bond three. It's waterproof, and I mean to tell you, it's some good stuff. Clean it up a little bit. Okay. On this bird, you see how you've got a little bit of fuzz that comes out from the drill press. So all I'm going to do is clean it up. So we've got him cleaned up. Now we've got to find a little something to put inside of him, which is a penny works good, a nail head, an old washer, anything you've got laying around. The reason I put something inside of them, a hollow bird is worth more than a solid bird, especially a gunner bird. It takes longer to make them. It takes, uh, people like them hollow. Like again, they float better. Um, they all the moisture's gone out of it. So when they shake that, they're going to know it's hollow. And that's the main reason I put something inside of there. I take my tight bond three.
Now, if you let this tape bomb thing sit a few minutes before you put it together, you'll see how it almost acts like Gorilla Glue. It starts foaming up a little bit. Makes a really, really good seal. Um, don't send me notes and letters saying, can I use Gorilla Glue? Can I use Elmer's Glue? It's up to you. You can use anything you want. Doesn't matter to me. I'm just telling you, I think the best is through experience and that way you won't screw up. That's my first little nail. These are about an inch, inch and a quarter. My angle at the end to, hit, to make sure I hit something. Usually after a hard day's work, the last thing I do before I go in is glue bottom boards on. They'll say this stuff might dry in six or eight hours. I don't trust it. I make sure it's dry so I give it all night long. So the last thing I do before I go in is glue bottom boards on. You don't have to worry about your nails being stainless or galvanized. It's a gum bird. You're going to cover the head of it up anyway. You're going to countersink it. On the small birds like ruddy ducks, teal, buffalo heads, I put one, two, three, four, five, six. On bigger ducks, I'll put three down the side. If it's really big, I might put four down the side. So, I'm going to countersink all my nails. I hear people say, well, you've got to put rubber gaskets in it and all the stuff to make sure it never sinks on you. It doesn't leak. The sun I've got, if you want to come to my shop, anybody, I've got 300 of my own decoys here. They've been together. Some of these birds have been with me now for 40 years. They never sank. They never come apart. Uh, you don't have to take my word for it. Just come here and look at them. If I was going to make them to sink, I wouldn't be showing you this. <laughs> Is this Elmer's? exterior wood filler. It's a really, really good wood filler. I don't know why they make it interior, exterior, because if you're going to use it inside, it doesn't matter if it's exterior or not. So you want to make sure it is exterior filler. I fill these nail heads in. And usually my hammer will make a dent somewhere around. I usually miss a nail a couple times. Just fill that in too. And again, after I paint this, sand it, you're not going to see the nail heads. That's it. Uh, my name is Kristen Sullivan. I'm the executive director of the Ward Foundation, which is the nonprofit that staffs and operates the Ward Museum of Wildfowl Art, Salisbury University. And we also put on the Ward World Championship Wildfowl Carving Competition and Art Festival. The Ward World Championship, uh, as we call it here in House Worlds, um, began in 1971 as a carving competition in Salisbury, Maryland. And at that time, there were a number of um, carving competitions and festivals that happened throughout the country, but this really became, I think, the biggest that, the, that there is. It's, it's grown into really an amazing annual event that gets folks from, I think, 15 different countries at this point in all 50 states. But it started out really as a competition uh, that celebrated the, I think, where, where decoy carving came from, as well as where it was headed into this more decorative sort of style. We heard about this show and we came down to it, and it was over at the Civic Center here in Salisbury. Uh, and we found out that, my gosh, they had a world championship carving contest that year, 1971, 
So the following year we came to it, 1972, and we've been coming every year since. I'm uh, Rich Snoker from uh, Marion Station, Maryland. Uh, I'm the chairman of the board of directors. Um, I was doing gunning decoys um, and wanted to get into doing decorative birds. So birds with all the feathers carved and all the feathers burned. And it was a big learning curve for me because there wasn't anybody in my area who did any of this. I mean, nobody. Um, you know, my dad carved, I carved, and uh, my uh, uh, employer, uh, Wilson Diddy, carved too. But, you know, they, they weren't involved with um, competition whatsoever. But I wanted to get involved with competition. I think I've watched the evolution of the competition in different categories. Most notably, probably, uh, the, the competition with the champagne class of both floating and non-floating decoys, which just for a point of information, all of those little decoys must fit through a three and a half inch circular um, opening so that they are indeed uh, of a smaller size. Uh, my name is Kent Kimmel. Uh, I'm the Chairman Emeritus of the Ward Foundation Board of Directors. When I, when I look at the the, some of the earlier works that are in the museum now and thinking back about the competition, the works now going forward are much more elaborate, um, much more detailed, uh, more varieties. I think that's one of the biggest things that uh, uh, a number of our competitors are carving um, more exotic pieces than they used to. Um, I think that the, the pieces that are, the floating pieces are uh, much more detailed than they, they had been in the past. More elaborate, I guess, is, is probably uh, the big thing. I think having the addition of a couple more of the divisions or classes. The champagne class, which I mentioned before, uh, was an evolution in uh, the artwork itself. And to be honest with you, I'm absolutely amazed at the detail of some of those pieces, which are so small. As with any art form, um, there are stylistic changes that happen over the years. And, and I think with decoy making and, and wildfowl art in general, um, it's tended to get more decorative and, and perhaps a little um, finer carving detail, that sort of thing. Um, and people have really started to experiment over the years with the form as well. And, and we've seen some really uh, amazing um, progressions in interpretive carving, you know, really how people kind of connect with wildfowl and with nature and, 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 and they express that through the art form. Um, there are definitely folks who continue to do and, and to evolve the um, antique hunting style decoys, but even those tend to get a little bit more decorative. Um, and, and so it's a, it's a wide range. I think that in general, the progression goes toward the decorative over the years, um, but it's, it's still, you still see the traditional hunting style decoys to the um, interpretive and, and more decorative end of things. And I would like to see more competition amongst and between women. Um, and persons of color. Uh, I would like to see more, co uh, more competitors come from other countries outside the United States. Personally, would love to see the event embraced and expanded and, um, and really pushed by n the folks who have been a part of the event, for sure, um, because they are, they are our, our foundation and um, the reason it exists, but also some new folks coming in, you know, younger carvers, more women carvers, folks of diverse um, backgrounds and heritages being part of this event, I think would make it that much richer to bring in maybe different, you know, styles of wildfowl art from different cultural traditions. That would be phenomenal. Um, I think there's also opportunity to perhaps expand the art festival portion of this. So it is the Ward World Championship Wildfowl Carving Competition and Art Festival. So there may be opportunity to expand in the areas of flat art or um, you know, different artistic traditions. Um, I think that could make it a really just a really rich event that has, has broad appeal. 
Uh, and I don't think that doing any of that would cause us to lose, you know, the, the sense of who we are and what the event is, but hopefully just, you know, brings more folks into the fold and, and helps it continue and evolve into the future because the event's not now what it was 50 years ago and I think it just needs to continue to event to, to evolve, pardon me, and, um, and find new ways to bring in younger carvers and folks who didn't yet don't yet know that they love wildfowl art. <laughs> you know, with the, with the idea of keeping the art form at the forefront uh, moving forward. It's a world-class event. Let's make it a world-class event. We need you. What are you doing? Well, I ran out of carving wood, so I'm using my battery-operated brushless Mestiza too to cut down this tree and get some more. What are you thinking? MDI Wood Carver Supply not only has all your favorite carving tools, but also basswood, Tuplo, Maine White Cedar, all ready to be shipped. We are the British Decoy and Wildfowl Carvers Association and I'm going to tell you about some of our experiences going to visit the worlds. The Brits are coming. My name is Pam Wilson. I've been to quite a few shows in the US over the years but not the worlds and in 2014 I decided Next year, I'm going to the world. I told some of my friends in the BDWCA about this, and the next thing it became, let's go to the worlds this year. It looked like it was gonna be an all girls trip, five of us, but then we allowed one boy and his wife to come too. So let's do everything, we said. Let's go early and do one of the classes, go to workshops and seminars, and enter the competition. After checking into our oceanfront rooms at the Castle in the Sand Hotel, which had been recommended to us, the first thing on the agenda was the ward classes. Jan and Chris were doing an old score decoy with Rich and Ross Smoker. Claire and myself, a saw wet owl with Laurie and Mike Trueheart. And Sally, a chestnut sided warbler with Josh Gooji. Afterwards, we took them down to the beach and posed them in the sand. And here we all are, holding our finished carvings. Entering the competition. Five of us entered birds on the Thursday of the show. The judging was on the Friday and most of us were in seminars while this was going on. Getting teased a bit at some times, hence the title, The Brits Are Coming, but everyone was actually very, very friendly and encouraging. And then, we went back into the hall. Claire, who had been persuaded to enter at advanced level in interpretive wildlife sculptures, had won the blue ribbon, best in division. 
with her carving wren on old stump. She was over the moon. Richard, who had entered advanced decorative life size with his hoopoe, also got a blue ribbon as best in category. And Sally had won third place in the intermediate interpretive division with her puffins. Everyone was so, so pleased. There were so many highlights of this trip. I can't possibly tell you all of them, but one of them has to have been Saturday evening in the bar of the Castle in the Sand. Del Herbert, who I'd known for some years, came across to have a chat with the group and to introduce the ring bearers that were in the bar at the time those carvers who had won a world championship award one or more times, such as Pat Godin and Jack Brunet, as well as Tom Christie, Tom Matus, and himself, of course. And various other carvers did subsequently come and sit down and have a chat. It was a gorgeous time and we laughed. A lot. The Living Legends Award was one of the reasons I wanted to be there in 2015 because Bob Sutton, who by then was a good friend of mine, was being honoured along with Pat Godin and William Vesey. And the next morning I was able to take this picture of Bob with a couple of his birds and his award, which he told me was very heavy and he wasn't sure how he was gonna get it home. I treasure this memory. Sadly, we lost Bob the next year. And finally, for this trip, it had to be a visit to the Ward Museum. A fantastic place. We spent ages there looking at everything and taking an incredible amount of photographs. And that was the first of many visits that I have since made to the Ward Museum. And afterwards, we shared our experiences with other members of the BDWCA. I'm the editor of our magazine Wingspan, so I had to write one. But Jan kindly also wrote one, telling all about the old school workshop. In 2016, I was back again, together with Richard and Leslie. And we were also joined by two BDWCA members from Sweden, Lennart and Anne. I did another ward class this time a golden eagle head, and once again with Laurie and Mike. And I had to do a flag check. In 2015, Claire, who comes from Wales, and Sally, who lives in the Shetlands in Scotland, had one. And there weren't flags for those two countries on display but it was promised that there would be in 2016. And as you can see, there were. And there were some surprises in store. I had been totally inspired by the interpretive carvings I had seen at the 2015 show. So I went home and started carving and I entered my carving in the 2016 show. Imagine my surprise when I discovered that my court in Greaves had won the blue ribbon, best in division, at intermediate level. And Richard, who had entered advanced decorative life-size 
with his hen pheasant, took second place. And Leonard was awarded two third places and an honourable mention for three of his fish carvings. 2017 and I was back again, together with Richard and Leslie, and Claire had come again as well. We were joined on their first visit by Mark and Yvonne, who had been inspired by what they had read. I did another ward class, a red phase score pal, again with Laurie and Mike. And Richard and Mark took a half day texturing course with Richard Reeves. This year I had volunteered to work as a clerk to the judges and Claire got roped in to help with transporting decoys to the tanks. And while we were working, my pheasant won the blue ribbon, intermediate interpretives, and Claire's wren took second place in advanced interpretives. Richard received an honourable mention at advanced level for both his grouse and his sparrowhawk, and Mark in his first year also received an honourable mention at intermediate level for his European starling. We posed with our birds and their rosettes on Sunday back at the hotel, and then we met up with Jet Brunet to celebrate that evening. And afterwards, Mark wrote a great article for Wingspan and all our members, telling them all about his experiences, plenty of pictures. It was just Claire and myself in 2018. I did another ward class, an American Kestrel, once again with Laurie and Mike. And Claire joined Glen McMurdo on his three-day course, painting a killdeer. Claire and I were both working as clerks to the judges. Claire was with Intermediate Decorative Life Size Wildfowl, and we both clerked two of the junior divisions on the Saturday. And on the Friday, I was clerking both World and Masters Interpretive Wood Sculpture, as well as Palm Fronds and Feathers. Judging, and therefore clerking, a world division is different to all the other divisions because nobody knows the results until the end of the award presentations on the Saturday evening, and they have been judged Friday morning. So everybody concerned has to keep the secret. So the judges' discussions were very confidential and then kept secret until Saturday evening when after the show had closed and everybody had gone into the theatre ready for the presentations, I got to put the winning rosettes on the carvings that people would see the next morning. Claire had entered her first ever painted carving, Pingu, in advanced interpretive wood sculpture, and he took second place. You can see her here having a discussion with Del Herbert all about him. And afterwards, more Wingspan articles. Claire wrote one all about her experiences and I wrote about judging the world interpretives. There were more of us in 2019. Claire, Mark and Yvonne, Leonard and Anne, and of course myself, and a new visitor, Jan. This year, Claire and I did the Carve and Paint a Red-Tailed Hawk Tail Feather course with Al Jordan. As you can see, he made me feel a little bit on the short side. We also worked as clerks to the judges.
there were some pleasing results. Yvonne, who was inspired to start carving after her visit to the Worlds in 2017, won second and third place in novice interpretive wood sculpture, beating her husband Mark, who got an honourable mention in intermediate decorative life size with his European nut hatch. And Lenart got second in advanced decorative life size shorebirds and wading birds and an honourable mention in advanced interpretive wood sculpture. When COVID-19 struck in 2020, 10 of us were all ready to come, including three new carvers and their wives. We miss all the friends we have made at the Worlds, and we do hope to see you all soon, hopefully in 2022. But don't worry, the Brits will be coming back. I'm going to glue two more heads on right now to show you how to glue a head on without using nails, screws, bolts, dowels. You go to the store and you get you some Bondo, polyester based Bondo. If it'll hold a car together, it's going to damn well hold a duck together. I've been using this as long as I can remember. Show you how long it takes to put a head on. It's a two-part. There's the body filler. Here's a here's the hardener. Add just a dash of hardener. And the smell of it away pretty quick. Easy I've got the shop out. I'm doing a bunch of birds. I number my bodies and the head to make sure I got the right one. I've already fit it. Make sure it fits pretty flush. Again, with the drill press to seat the head. And that's it. And when you say that's not going to hold, that's going to come off. You're wrong. I'm right. It ain't going to come off. If you strike this neck against the side of the gunnel on the boat or hit it with something, it's going to break where you hit it. It's not going to break where the glue is. That's it. No nails, no screws. This head has been recessed into the body. The other way is to make a shelf. A lot of people, a lot of the old carvers, we put the ice groove down here for the rain to water, water to run off it. And it's really called making a little shelf on it. It'll give you a nice looking neck when you, when you finish it down. Don't actually push it too hard. You don't want to squeeze the glue completely out of your, out of your crack here, out of the seam. You want the glue to be to be working for you, not against you. So you can see where I've left enough meat on the neck and enough meat here on the breast and the neck. Don't make your heads straighten your necks straight down. You're going to have the neck come down and it's going to have a square shelf. It's not going to look right. I put these together last night to make sure they're really good and dry. This dries in a matter, it's gonna set up in a matter of minutes, the Bondo does. It'll dry really good in probably an hour or so, really hard. I still don't mess with it until I make sure it's pretty much six or eight hours. This is uh, 
This was put together last night. And again, you can see where I've got plenty of base on the net, plenty of base on the, on the breast here. And I'm gonna take a knife. You can use a fording tool on this. But this is what I do. Just to flare it out. You're saying, I know people, you people out there, Tommy Magnus and Marty and some of you boys, <laughs> you're probably cringing now, saying, oh my God, he's tearing that knife up. Well, yeah, I probably will. But this, boy, this is the way I've been doing it. I, I haven't broke a blade yet. Uh, they get a little bit dull. And uh, I just resharpen them. All I'm doing is even that seam up. And they're, they're saying, why don't you go in the other room and get on that Fordham with a carbide cuts all with a bit and smooth this down? Well, I don't know. Sometimes if I'm doing eight or ten birds and my hand hurts and my shoulder hurts, then I get on the on there with a cuss on the carbide, the grinding bit. I just don't, I just don't feel the same. So now you've got a don't 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 be afraid to take wood off. You want to give it a nice looking neck body joint and now that's ready to sand and when I sand that it's going to come out just like that little guy you're going to have a little teeny seam there where the bondo is and let me tell you something about bondo Captain. it's never going to shrink wood filler shrinks bondo doesn't shrink I can show you birds over there has been glued together for 30 years never shrinks no cracks around here and no separation and they've been gone hard people ask i guess i'm going to need a bandsaw to start this off well you need access to a bandsaw bandsaw i use the, the craftsman 14 inch horse and a half motor that'll pretty much do anything you want to do if if i use them it's only on i'm on my second one in 52 years if i can't tear them up they pretty much can't be torn up i make Roughly 250 birds a year. I made 156 gunner birds last year, plus my shore birds. So I'm, I'm wearing a, I'm using a saw a lot. Uh, I take the guard off it, it'll cut about seven and a half inches thick. Again, on that saw, I can cut the side view, the top view, I can knock the shoulders off it. Some of your friends will say, well, you might want to make a swan someday or a goose. So you need one with a big riser block. And now you're in a thousand dollars, 1200. 1800 yeah in about three weeks I'll be able to buy that saw for $700 on eBay because you're gonna quit so you need access to a saw start off go somewhere I've got several friends I cut their birds out for them get a couple birds cut out a couple heads start off my own opinion people like cousins John Walls makes my knives there's a lot of knife makers Get you a good knife. Learn how to carve. Um, I'm doing some some black-headed gull heads. I gotta make three gulls. It's all hand carved. I mean, I just I sit here all day long and, and make chips fly. Get you a knife. Get somebody to cut you out some heads and bodies. Start with a buffalo head, a ruddy duck, a bluebill, white and black. Cigar told me a long time ago. He said, why do I want to make widgeons and teal and wood ducks? Why do I want to paint red, blue, green, and yellow when I can make all the money I want off white, black, and brown? And that's pretty much it, folks. When you think about all your diving ducks, all your hens, I mean, <coughs> excuse me, they're white, black, and brown. So uh, learn to paint in, in baby steps. Carve you a few little miniatures. Graduate up to a bigger bird. Don't make yourself, don't wear yourself out, tie yourself out, because you're just going to quit. Um, check with the Ward Foundation uh, constantly. They offer a multitude of classes. God, people like Rich Smoker. Uh, Rich teaches, uh, uh, I don't know how many classes a year. Uh, he's, he's forgotten more about carving than I'll probably ever know. Great, great instructor. So check with the Ward Foundation, take a class, learn something.